All right, everyone. Good morning. Let's do that again. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I am very, very honored that so many people got out of bed and are here joining us this morning. So thank you for that. I'm also very, very privileged that given the TEDx kind of format of the rest of the day that I have 45 minutes with you. Now having said that, for me, 45 minutes is like the speed dating of a master class, okay? So we are uh, going to get into things as, as deep as I can get in the time that we have together. And my goal for us today is twofold. One, I want to serve a bit as a catalyst for thought. I'm we're probably going to present some ideas that are a little bit less than what convention um, puts forth, at least in the, in the first bit of what I'm going to talk about in terms of engagement. Then I want to also leave you with some of the process or how-tos of uh, tackling this scenario-based learning, and especially in an e-learning scenario. So some of the, my later slides I've constructed in such a way that when you get the slide deck, you could actually use them as a, uh, a thought jogger, a checklist, and things along those lines. So usually I don't like to have um, too much text on my slides, but I wanted to make sure that there was a purpose for the end. So it was my design, if you want to think of it that way. So all right, let's get moving then. I don't know how much everyone can see the details of this cartoon, but I wonder how familiar this is. So you have a, a fellow at his desk going blah, 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 click next, click next, blah, 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 click next. Uh, and then the boss coming in and saying, Tom, how'd you make out with that e-learning course? I finished it in 43 minutes. Uh, but what was it about? Uh, uh, it, was so, it was about something, um, click next, <laughs> right? So I wonder how many people this resonates with, either as a learner or hopefully not as a designer, but as, at the end of the day. And what I want to explore here is what is really the problem? Is it a learner engagement problem or a learning experience problem? Okay? And there is a whole lot of research out there in terms of student and learner, learner engagement, as well as employee engagement, right? I mean, that's the big term. We don't have, not enough employees are engaged. We got to get them into engage, blah, 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 blah. But what does it really mean? And what, what are the nuggets that we're trying to, or at the core of it, what are we trying to influence? Is what I want to get at. And I think sometimes there is a disconnect between theory and practice. I've always been a proponent from a very young age in terms of my career in academia and everything like that, that they really go hand in hand. And so much you have academics poo-pooing the practitioners and you have the practitioners poo-pooing the academics when they're two sides of the same coin and we need both to inform the other. So I want to propose to you today that we don't have a learner engagement problem, we have a learning experience problem. And this is where I'm going to kind of throw the cat amongst the pigeons, so to speak. Everything that I've read, and in terms of the, the research about engagement, and the definition I have up here is kind of my amalgamation of that, is that engagement is a, the internal process in a human being. It is actually an outcome of a few things that are going on with inside an individual. And what's happening is, is that based on the perceived value of the learning experience, as it interplays with the individual's own degree of what we call self-efficacy or their confidence, their growth in their own confidence and abilities, that's where engagement comes from. Now, where does the perceived value come from? And that comes from this notion of intrinsic motivation. And we're going to talk about motivation, a snapshot of it, in a few minutes. So if you can just kind of follow my argument here, and I, you know, you don't have to agree with me. This is why I said I want to be a bit of a catalyst and ha happy to have a discussion after this 45 minutes, since we only have very little bit of time. But again, think that engagement is the outcome of the learner's perceived value of the learning experience interplaying with their own degree of really self-confidence in 
the knowledge and the learning and their skills. Now experience then, on the other hand, is something that we actually have an opportunity to influence. Now anyone who's taught in a classroom and has designed learning and watched it being taught, all right, because I know it goes either way, you could have the same activities with two different groups and two very, very different outcomes. I know I've done this, you know, I've been teaching at a university level off and on since the late 90s, and I would do this amazing activity and it was just, it just go absolutely gangbusters with my students in one tutorial class. And 40 minutes later I do it again and it falls completely flat. And you're like, what in the world is going on? So it's, we can create, all right, the conditions which motivation, intrinsic motivation is ignited. So for me, experience is the co-created, all right, so it's not just us because there is an interaction with the learner, a co-created contextual conditions, right, it depends on the circumstances that we're dealing with, within which the learner, <coughs> the, which, sorry, within which learners experience the learning environment, including the instructor, the physical or virtual surroundings, the course and the content design, as well as established institutional or classroom cognitive and emotional cultures. Let's face it, we're human beings, things are complex. We really, really, really try to make them less complex and sometimes we're very good at doing that and sometimes we miss the boat in, in that attempt. So I want to challenge you to look at this in a multifaceted way and recognize that it isn't as simple, simple as following a checklist and slapping some you know, interesting narrative on a scenario and away we go, right? So let's look at this a little bit more. All right, so then the ultimate question is, or what I'm stating, kind of jumped ahead, is that we don't have a learner engagement problem, we have a learning experience problem. Because if we had a learner engagement problem, the people are the problem. We don't ever, ever, ever want to make the people the problem. Occasionally it happens. But <laughs> we really don't want to, to focus on that. We want to focus on, excuse me, on areas that we have some influence. And really, the internal processes of any human being, sometimes we don't even have that on ourselves, let alone, you know, other people and, you know, if anyone has a, a spouse or significant other, we know how well that goes, right? So, the people aren't the problem, the experience, perhaps, is the problem. So let's look at a snapshot of the science of motivation. And I'm looking at the social science, not the cognitive science, necessarily. Um, there is more out there on that. <laughs> Excuse me. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot going on here. And I'm not going to sit here and read this slide and you can have a look at it later. And there, I thought it was really well put together. Um, when we think of motivation, we often think of carrots and sticks, right? And, and we all know that's extrinsic motivation. That is motivation outside of the individual. And it works to a certain degree and in certain situations for a certain period of time. It doesn't work when we start trying to work on very complex problems and we're trying to motivate people to problem solve at that level. But if we wanted someone to um, jump rope faster, right, then extrinsic motivation could work. Come on, another 10. Let's see if you can do it in 10 seconds less. And in, in those instances, in uh, extrinsic, excuse me, motivation works really well, you know, rewards and punishments and things like that. But not so much in terms of creating intrinsic motivation. So there are a number of theories out there. I'm just going to touch on a few. Um, everybody's fairly familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? And if, you know, you could be, have the best experience design that you want, but if somebody doesn't feel safe, then the, it, the, things aren't going to work. So you could create a great learning experience but in the room you might have a toxic culture from an organization, someone, people are not going to feel safe to, enough to participate in many cases, right? So 
there's a lot, this is why I'm saying there's a lot going on here. But high, uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs is one of those areas that um, can help instigate uh, or ignite um, intrinsic motivation. But you couple that with the self-determination theory. And this is really, really important because especially as adults, we want to feel that we have a level of autonomy and control and participation and that we feel valued. Okay? And self-determination plays into that. The other topic or motiv intrinsic motivation um, theory, it goes with more than motivation, but is flow state. How many people are familiar with flow state? Yeah, fair few, absolutely. Essentially, what this, this theory it talks about is that intrinsic motivation occurs when there is a balance between the learner's present skills and the challenges he or she is facing. So a learner possessing low problem solving skills will only be able to solve problems with a low challenge. Solving problems will then increase their skills and to keep them motivated, the challenge has to increase as the learner's skills increase. Right? And that's, I, I wish I could point with my little pointer here, <laughs> but that is the cycle in there. So you have to figure out where their skill set is in the first place. Uh, or in some cases, I know we're, we're creating learning for a large kind of organizational um, uh, audience, so there's varying, but as best as you can, and then have them c complete those challenges that circles them around in terms of chal challenges and increasing their skill sets and, and so on and so forth. This keeps them engaged, which is the outcome of the intrinsic motivation. The theory says that when you present a person with a problem that resides within the flow channel, as you can see up there, he or she will be intrinsically motivated to solve that problem. So you must design scenario-based learning, whether it's face-to-face -face or if it's e-learning, with this particular theory in mind. So you must balance the scenario's challenges with the skills you can expect of your target audience in such a way, in most cases at least, that the problem that need, the problems that need solving reside within the flow channel, sometimes even on the edge of it. So that, remember a time in your own learning experience, your own growth, where you feel like you're on the edge of, of being able to keep your head above water. I've often said to my students at the beginning of a term, during this term you are going to be challenged and sometimes you're going to feel like you can barely breathe your chin's just above water. And so many of us think that that's a bad thing, we got to get rid of it. And when I say to them, it's growth. You're being stretched. So this is what we want to be doing in an incremental or gradual fashion. We don't want to freak people out, right? But this is where we need to challenge ourselves. And this is where your value as instructional designers come into play. It's too easy to take the easy road and just slap some learning together. It's a challenge professionally to challenge other people. So this is what an intrinsically motivated learner looks like. They employ strategies that demand more effort. They process information more deeply. They prefer tasks that are more challenging. Um, they will put in a greater effort, which is usually what we're measuring. They'll show long-term retention of what was learned. They apply the knowledge more often than others, and they perceive themselves more competent. That's that self-efficacy thing that we were mentioning. So other factors, it, they, uh, identifying relevance of learning goals heightens the motivation, and contextualizing learning and the applicability of skills. I kind of... Um, threw that in there, I have it more in another slide. So I was mixing things up a bit and I, I probably should have put that later. So how do we create the conditions? What is involved? What are those conditions 
that will ignite intrinsic motivation. What are the conditions? Well, curiosity, right? We want people to be curious. We can do that through narrative. We want to, to um, in put in creativity and a bit of fun with what we're doing, yet keep it realistic. We want to build in autonomy and control for the learner. Again, that notion of challenge and then mastery. The contextualization and the purpose. I can't tell you how many times, and I'm very sure, I'd be very surprised if anyone here would disagree, where we haven't had times where we're like, what is the purpose of what we're doing? This is pointless and a waste of my life units. Right? So I figure, somebody said once a long way, we have life units, and each one of those life units are precious. So I don't want to be wasting my life units, right? Or anyone else's. Uh, this notion of interactivity, which can take many different forms, as you all know. And so these are, these are the elements to crea of creating the conditions for intrinsic motivation. Right? So if we are learning experience designers, which uh, you, we're starting to see the shift from instructional design, which went along with, I'm the expert, you aren't, to a learning experience, then we need to be influencing these elements in terms of the design that we create for the learner so that in the end, the intrinsic motivation is, is ignited and the engagement is then captured. You all with me so far? I know I got kind of academic on you. So, so this, is the, this is kind of the, the more practical side of things. <clears throat> And we have about uh, 25 minutes or so, so we'll see how we go with this. So let's talk about designing the experience. Now, what we're talking about, regardless if it's e-learning or face-to-face, -face, is scenario-based learning. And it's ideal for a number of different things in terms of formulating strategy, identifying issues, uh, generating sensitivity to change, practicing new, newly acquired skills in a safe con uh, context, Stimulating action, improving analytical skills, encouraging problem solving, and improving soft skills. I have a little asterisk by the soft skills, just because while I do think if it's done correctly, it can improve soft skills, um, being a person who my whole background is about soft skills, you really need to practice it. And you can practice it intellectually or you can practice it physically. And it's one of those things, until you practic practice soft skills physically time and time again, just like writing is a craft, it's kind of hard to really get it, right? Um, so I, that's why I put a little asterisk by that one. But the point here is that it's ideal for a number of different things. And if what you're trying, the goals and the outcomes you're trying to achieve don't fit into one of these areas, then you probably don't want to use scenario-based learning. Right? So really, really think about what it is you're trying to achieve and the outcome and, and pull the right tool from your toolbox. So the key characteristics here is you need to make sure that it's realistic and informative. <clears throat> so you're involving experienced people to identify the objectives and the activities. Experienced people being the subject matter experts, but it's more than subject matter experts in this issue because we're, we're looking at what problem are we trying to solve, what gap are we trying to fill, and so while a subject matter expert may be part of that, there might be also a man management or managers who are seeing what errors are being made that need to be involved as well. Um, make it relatable. So uh, model characters after real people and avoid irrelevant details just for the sake of entertainment. So I'm all for storytelling, I'm all for narrative, but don't go too far afield or you might create cognitive overload or distraction at the very least. So make sure it's learner-centric. Again, these are key characteristics. Um, draw upon the learner's core strengths. Right? They're all, so you can establish their confidence level, draw on those core strengths to move forward. 
Focus on performance improvement, not the correct answers. Because otherwise it just might as well be a true and false multiple test choice or, you know, assessment. And provide as we would feedback, you know, remediation and reinforcement along the way. That's absolutely uh, key in any learning, but certainly in scenario based learning. Okay, applied learning strategies. This requires the learner to have a basic knowledge of the topic or topics prior to the scenario. So they're coming in with assumed knowledge. Provide opportunities to analyze, evaluate, and finally to create solution, solutions based on their knowledge. And then allow learners allow learners to learn through their mistakes with plausible consequences. This is probably one of the really important key points of scenario based learning is that people need to see the consequences of their choices. And because it's scenario based, because it's a safe environment, they have this opportunity to screw up without really screwing up, right? I mean, it's just like if anybody works in the area of um, IT and you're rolling out a huge software like SAP or something across an organization, you have a test environment first. Right? You don't just deploy it across 8,000 employees and just hope for the best, although sometimes it still happens. But, <laughs> so, but you, you have a test environment so they can see the consequences of their choices. Interaction, and this is where, you know, we tend to focus a lot of time and that's fine, it's good, it's important. Um, Interaction then requires the selection of responses to move learners through the lessons, again, instead of just answering correct, con you know, answering content questions. You're supplying um, information only as needed, right? And that adds to the contextual basis of it. Uh, you're using images and sound to enhance the experience. It's not there for whiz bang effect. It's there to enhance the experience. Um, and as a very simple example, is changing facial expressions and backgrounds. All right? Because I, I understand that when these these types of projects are done, the budgets are you know tiny to a fair bit. Usually tiny, right? So we have to be creative and work with what we have. should groove, moving and grooving. Okay. So those are at the high level, the key characteristics. All right. Let's move into a little bit about more of a process that I've gone through in the past with clients. Right? So you want to involve your subject matter experts and other stakeholders. You want to conduct a discovery and collaboration session. And I would say sessions. Probably more so than other types of learning design, the scenario based learning, it's really what's in their heads. And them giving you a bunch of PowerPoint slides with some content is usually not going to do it. It's good to get you up to speed, but when you actually go to start creating the design or the scenarios, you need to be sitting with them, working through it, asking questions, collaborating on the scenario that is created and the choice responses and the feedback and, uh, and keeping your finger on the pulse as to whether or not that is going to be accurate and fill the needs. There was a client that I worked with a few years ago. Um, we spent five days, eight, ten hours a day in a room with four SMEs to create the three or four scenarios, branching scenarios, um, with them. I mean, it was intense. My, my brain hurt. So this is really key, and you could knock out a whole lot in, by doing this. Th this is really, 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 really critical. And if you get this right, or close to right, then the rest of the process is going to be very uh, smoother. It'll go smoother. Just like anything else, we need to analyze where are the learners making the real world errors? 
Okay? What errors are they making? Where are they making them? Why are they making these mistakes? What behaviors need to change so they avoid these errors? What are the metrics needed to demonstrate the impact to the business? There's a, been a LinkedIn report that came out recently talking about um, L&D's importance or impact in perceived impact in businesses and so often the ROI that we're measuring is fluffy stuff. Okay? So we can change that. And as excited as I am about what feedback you give me today, yes, um, I'm more excited to hear about what impacts you go, then go on and have in your organizations. Okay? So we have to really decide what we're, what we're measuring. Uh, what resources can assist, oh sorry, that's the next one. What resources can assist learners to navigate to the optimal path? Right? And so in that discovery session with the SMEs and stakeholders, a lot of this is being spoken about. So then collaborate to build. What does a realistic scenario look like? What is the contextualization to it? What are the descriptions of success and fail behaviors? What does it look like in practice? What are the indicators of an on par or optimal response? What are the indicators of a subpar or suboptimal response? And what are the indicators of I'm calling a non par or non optimal response, for lack of a better term to keep it as uh, consistent as possible? Because when you're creating this, with the SMEs, you say, okay, someone comes into the branch of my bank and my teller greets them. How should they greet them? Here's your three options. Okay, I chose, perhaps I was a learner and didn't realize I chose the, the um, suboptimal response. Well, here's my consequence to that, to that choice. And then so forth it goes. But I wouldn't know that unless I'm sitting there working hand in hand with the experts. So to give you an idea of one way of putting this together, I find spreadsheets work really, really well. I have two different sh examples of this. So you have the, <coughs> excuse me, the scenario on top, the, the actual challenge, the choices, the consequences of those choices, and then the conclusions, and sometimes you have next steps. That could be the resources they could go to. It could be any number of things. And this is with, I would use this to plot and plan a non-branching scenario. Okay? Because you can have branching, you can have non-branching. Right? <coughs> There's something there on the left hand, my left hand side, um, that says uh, advisor one comment, advisor two comment. I'll talk about that a little bit later. And at the end of the time, be sure to reflect on the appropriateness of the questions in relation to the scenario. You all with me so far? Yeah? It's a lot for breakfast. So once you have those scenarios mapped out on your spreadsheet, of course we would want to go to, you know, a storyboarding process. I'm not going to teach you how to storyboard. Um, some of the elements that you would want with that, a dis situational description, uh, posing of the problem, um, these are the screens that you need to devote to in your storyboards. Uh, opportunity to consult advisors, which is optional, and a request for the learners to select behavior that represents the best course of action. So you would have a series of these storyboards um, capturing these different screens. And I will be providing the slides so you can have them as well, so if that, that you find that helpful. The other part of the build for me is I talked about storytelling and narrative. I find that that is hugely important. And I keep saying that. There's a lot of things I keep saying are hugely important. So I hope you're taking notes and, and putting asterisks by them. Not everything's not hugely important, but certain things are. And I found that uh, we're social beings. As human beings, we love stories. We live in stories. We get home from work and we sit down and watch stories or read stories. We love stories. We love narrative. So what I found, you know, several years ago, um, I had the privilege of being awarded Best Instructional Designer in LearnX. And it wasn't because my design was so crash hot. 
really. It was because I incorporated a compelling story for the target audience into systems training. Right? Yay, systems training. Okay? <laughs> so storytelling is, is ultra important. So some of our, some of the characteristics or the ingredients of a story, well, authentic storyline or a plot, right? Credible characters, a twist or a motivator, a challenge, emotional, an emotional dimension to all of that, as well as some high points, and finally, a resolution. We don't like stories that are left hanging. It really bothers us psychologically, right? Even those stories that we have to wait another year to watch the rest of the movie, right? I don't know about you, but it niggles at me. So remember the importance of storytelling along the way. Now, I mentioned that uh, scenario-based learning or scenarios can be standalone or they can be branching. And oftentimes in e-learning, we have that beautiful ability to do a branching uh, scenarios. It does make it a lot more complex. Um, and I think of them kind of as the choose your own adventure stories, right? And well, I chose to go on uh, this, this way and these are the consequences which leads me over here and path leads on the path, way leads on the way and you never quite get back to where you were. Now, having said that, in e-learning scenario branching, it does actually kind of need to lead back. <laughs> so what you need to be able to do um, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but you need to be able to, and I'll show you in the next slide, but you need to be able to have certain pathways that end, and then the learner is out of the system and has to start again, and then you need to have certain pathways, especially if they, they choose suboptimal, not non-optimal, to get them back to the optimal, ultimate outcome. Now, having said that, one of the other ways of making this uh, learning process adaptive is if it's possible to do a pre-testing of the required knowledge. And while doing the pre-testing, so it's almost like a pre-e-learning little module, if they come out on a certain level with a pre-test that they don't have the prerequisite uh, information or knowledge, then they need to kind of get, not kicked out, but redirected to a module that will give them that prerequisite knowledge before going into the scenario-based learning. Yeah? I mean, it makes sense. Sometimes we don't have the budgets to do that. I get that. But in an ideal world, that would be the way we would do it. Um, and I mentioned the, the other parts there. That On that last point, in terms of um, a branching scenario, this would be a type of spreadsheet that I would use. It looks similar but different. Um, than the previous ones has the same has the same components, but um, in a different format. Because if you go down the columns, you have the on par, sub par, non par. This is where you get the opportunity to say, okay, here's here's the scenario. Here's the choices I have. The cho the learner chooses perhaps sub par response. This is what the answer they get. There'll be some feedback in there that I'll explain in a second. Here's then the next choice and so on. But being able to see it in columns allows you to adjust things so you can get them back on track, right? So that they don't just have to exit and say, well, you, you failed, go to attempt number two and try this again, okay? So those columns could quite get quite long until we get them to the ultimate goal. Now, with the feedback on this, with the feedback on this, um, when you're sitting there with your, uh, with your, doing the discovery session, sorry, with the SMEs. See, unlike you, I haven't had coffee yet, so, so I'm still like, ah. um, So when you sit down with your SMEs and you're determining what those errors are and those mistakes are, you're obviously creating the objectives, right, the learning objectives at that time and the outcomes and results that you want to see. And based on those outcomes and you, results you want to see, your feedback would flow from that. 
So is, if it's perhaps in the first instance, uh, the person says, good afternoon, my name is Jane, what brings you to ABC Golf Club today? It's smiling and friendly. Um, and that's great. The, the person, then that's what they choose. The next consequence is, hi, I'm Amanda, I would like to become a member. So in terms of the feedback, it would be, you know, great job, you greeted um, in an appropriate fashion, you used your name, uh, you smiled, and you asked a question. Right, so that's reinforcing that. Perhaps though, if they did subpar, the feedback would be, um, it's great that you, 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 you know, introduced yourself and asked the question. Um, perhaps you need to, uh, you know, show a bit more enthusiasm and be a bit more facially friendly or, you know, use your nonverbals better, right? So in this instance, if you have those, those bits of feedback or at least the attributes of the feedback, you know, friendliness, greeting, things like that, you can just in the feedback to the learner in your document, and later on you would, you would flesh that out, you could just put, you know, one, two, three, and four, if those are the attributes that are being touched upon in this, in this area, or the learning outcomes, yeah? Okay, I'm conscious I have about 10 minutes, so. So the last part, or maybe five minutes, <laughs> The last part is I wanted to give you some examples and some food for thought, right? Um, the, mostly to spur creativity. These aren't from my work. These are, were other work that I found that I really have a lot of respect for and, uh, and like. But I'm going to play a video, hopefully I've, this will work. It's only about three minutes. To create e-learning that's genuinely engaging, you have to see things differently. And I think that with great intent, you disconnect from the status quo. If you never change traditional e-learning, then what you really design is kind of shallow. But when you're willing to change things, then you open up a whole new world of engagement. Our comic style model is built for the very highest levels of engagement. It's incredibly captivating and yet remarkably performance focused. It's without a doubt the very best interaction we've ever built. We focused on the features that matter most to learners and we made profound discoveries for the first time, we're bringing scenario-based storytelling to e-learning. It's the most effective strategy to keep learner interest at all times. With the focus on story and visual communication, learning becomes clear. You get your point across without a great deal of text. You immerse the learner in an environment, and they feel an extraordinary level of autonomy, which in itself propels motivation. It's deeper engagement than instructor-led training. Beyond storytelling, the comic style is really meaningful to learners. We knew that context-sensitive feedback was a key part of driving performance. Context helps you frame the learning and understand how concepts can be applied in the real world. When you combine that with the power of characters, narrative patterns, and authentic dialogue, you end up with a learning event that's incredibly thought-provoking. Creating e-learning that's powered by visuals is amazingly fast because we adapted to illustration. We have three agile iterations. With a streamlined process, the comic style model helps you deliver engagement-driven e-learning in as little as two weeks. This is a thousand times more efficient than starting from scratch or an empty canvas. Comic style e-learning would seem to be a complete contradiction. It's built for extreme levels of engagement, but at the same time, it's remarkably transformative. To create it, we rigorously questioned the ways in which e-learning was designed and built in the past. We've been able to optimize corporate training to take full advantage of e-learning, and the results have been simply amazing. Scenario-based interactions in our comic style model is a total game changer for learners. No other e-learning comes close to this type of engagement. With the comic style model, we set out to design something extreme, and this led us to rethink everything about our process, everything about what's essential to e-learning. And that meant we could design the very best experience for all learners. Okay, so I don't know if you picked up in some of the key words there, but they were talking about autonomy, they were talking about story, they were talking about um, obviously learner engagement as, as it's traditionally defined. And 
and she's right. And I only have a few more minutes, so I'm going to quickly go through one quick example here. There, here's another example of e-learning that was done with still photos or, or uh, sketches and um, some audio. So you had the, the characters, the cast of characters, now the advisors. Now I kept talking about this advisor thing. So you can have a scenario where you have two advisors, credible advisors, right, to the learner. And the, they can listen to the advice that each of the advisors would give or gives the learner based on the situation before they go and then make a decision. Okay? And that's just an extra bit built in there. And usually those advisors might have somewhat contradictory advice, so it's not so obvious what choice to make. And they actually have to, the learner has to use their brain and figure out what would be the best option there. And so this is kind of what this would look like, or it does look like. Um, the choice is made, consequences then transpire. Okay? I'm just going to skip ahead. So on the slides when you get them, there are links to these. There, I've, I made them bit.ly links so they're a lot easier to, to do. So just quickly in summary, uh, make sure you're focusing on designing the experience. Um, creating the conditions for the intrinsic motivation to both ignite and emerge with your learners. Collaborate closely with your subject matter experts. They are part of your team in this endeavor. Um, be meticulous. Be sure that the questions and the responses really match the goals and the outcomes that you're trying to achieve. Have some fun and get creative. So I'll leave you with this quote by Sir Ken Robinson who I have a great deal of respect for. All you can do, like a farmer, is create the conditions under which the learners will begin to flourish. Thank you for your time this morning. Have a great rest of the day.